Hi, I'm Kelly Huang. I am so glad to be here to shed a light on how to break through the double pane glass ceiling as it relates to how to help Asian American women in the workplace reach the C-suite and the boardroom. I became interested in this topic from my work as the former co-chair of Women in Bios Boardroom Ready Program, where we've onboarded 135 women out of 150 participants. Hence, the topic of board diversity is very relevant to me. However, in helping these high potential women reach the C-suite as a coach, I am seeing a consistent lack of representation at the highest level in corporate America. So in trying to uncover what could be holding these high achieving women back, I thought about whoever was voted, voted the most likely to succeed, and usually, and back in high school, and usually, or even college, usually that person was the person that was the best scholar or the person with the highest GPA, but in corporate America today, does academic achievements automatically translate into success in the C-suite? Well, unfortunately, the data does not borne out for Asian Americans and especially Asian American women in particular. So I am going to uncover the three types of biases that are working against these women that are holding them back. But furthermore, in gaining a better understanding of these biases, I'm also hopeful that there are things we can do to address them in the second half of my talk. So in sharing the data about how Asians are highly educated but underrepresented, here are the four sets of type pie charts. So let's start with the left-hand side, the two over here, where we're talking about the fact that out of the general population where 38% are college educated, the Asians amongst them, 61% are holding college degrees. So again, they're very highly educated. However, does that translate into corporate room success? Well, from the right-hand side chart, you see that even though the professional workforce, Asians are represented at 13%, only 6% of the executives are Asian American and 4% are holding Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 seats. And an even smaller sliver that you see in the pie chart on the right are Asian American women holding seats at the C-suite level. And so you may ask, well, other than diversity reasons, why is it important to increase the representation of Asian women at the C-suite level or even in the boardroom? Well, from a global perspective, more than half of the consumers live in Asian countries and their spending is expected to represent about half of the global consumer spending by 2032. So that's coming up pretty quickly with India and China predicted to have the greatest increase in their consumer classes. So because we have this global consumer demand coming and the demographic change, it is pertinent and critical that Asians are represented at the highest level, and in particular, Asian American women to be those cultural ambassadors to help lend a voice to this rising group of global consumers. So next I wanna talk about why I call it the double paned glass ceiling. Well, maybe it's better that I spell it out as P-A-I-N-E-D, double pained, because for many of these Asian American women professionals, they are facing not only the gender, gender effects such as double bind, you're too nice or you're not aggressive enough, they also face what's called the Asian effect. So this has been studied by ASCEN, an Asian American advocacy group, where they looked at the technical companies, technology companies in Silicon Valley and found that in fact, the Asian effect is almost four times as insidious as the gender effect. So when these women are faced with these challenges, I in particular have found that here are three types of biases that they're up against. One is unfair assumption, two is unwanted attention, and third is access. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about each one of those in more details. So what are those unfair assumptions? 
Well, at the surface, and this is a Time Magazine, looking at this uh, Time Magazine cover, at the surface, these unfair assumptions look like it's a positive thing, right? So starting with the model minority myth, Times Magazine um, did the, the Wiz Kids cover story, right? Highlighting the achievements of all these uh, Asian American kids. And so the model minority myth, like I said, initially looks like it's a positive thing, but in fact, it does not paint a fair picture of what's happening across at least 20 different um, ethnic groups within the Asian American community. So it's painting too broad a picture and may even lead to some of these other stereotypes. So there's a stereotype about docile, docile worker bees, obviously high academic achievers. They tend to be introverted. They go into engineering or computer science. So some of these assumptions are not necessarily true, right? And so even the ethnic groups, each one has different income, demographic and cultural history that does not always fit into these stereotypes. So again, the unfair assumptions can really be unfair, right? In terms of holding some of these Asian American professionals back. And in addition, more recently, there's also the tiger mom stereotype um, as you know, Amy Chua had talked about her parenting style and some of the tiger moms that are, you know, in these cultural lores. But again, taking that, taking that into the workplace, it's not necessarily a fair assessment of somebody who might be at home, very, very um, demanding of their kids, but that doesn't mean they necessarily will bring that into the workplace. And then lastly, Back to what um, earlier the SN research talks about in terms of the double pain and the four times Asian effect, you definitely see this with the double bind. The Asian American women are doubly expected to be nice and also doubly criticized for not being aggressive enough. So these unfair assumptions can all come up in terms of looking at leadership styles and who's up for promotion and who are the people you want as team leaders. So taking a look at this and examining them and knowing them is important to helping these Asian women conquer those unfair biases. Next, that's insidious against these Asian American women are the unwanted attention. And what I know about unwanted attention is that inevitably it leads to microaggressions. So what are some of these? Well, definitely the perpetual foreigner. So I'm showing a picture of Anna Mae Wong, who's obviously very beautiful and very successful actress in her own right in the 20s in Hollywood. But she kept, you know, she was stereotyped into these exotic A Asian woman roles, these geishas role, these assassins. And even she herself could not, you know, continue in that path of playing these um, stereotypes. So that is something that, again, hurts the Asian woman's progression into the boardroom or into the C-suite because, right, there's kind of in the back of your mind these, you know, unfair um, stereotypes about them. And then more recently, you have the Vietnam War movies where, again, Asian women are depicted in these compromising positions. And that, again, can lead to the microaggressions, which I've heard somebody talked about how getting microaggressions every day or a joke or some comments can lead to, you know, feeling like you've got thousand paper cuts and think how, how unpleasant that is. So Asian women are constantly having to fend off, right? Some of these stereotypes. And in addition to that, there's also the cultural expectations that come from our own heritage culture. And I know I've gotten this comment consistently from my own relatives and from my mom. Wow, women in our culture don't do that. Or when I'm showing up as a strong leader in the workplace, I'm told by some of my other Asian elders, wow, you're supposed to respect your elders, even though you're the leader, but your elders are older than you. So those kind of cultural expectations from our heritage culture can also be a form of unwanted attention. Next, we definitely have some unequal access or on level playing field in terms of opportunities. 
And the way I want to demonstrate that is by sharing you sharing with you this Bain and Company survey recently done in 2022, where they found that of all the underrepresented groups, that Asian men are actually at the lowest at only feeling 16% belonging versus Asian women who are feeling the 20% belonging. And that is, I think, the outcome of having this unequal access and unlevel playing field when it comes to opportunities to advance. So even though you know, many of these Asian Americans are doing well and they're at the highest level of academic echelon, Unfortunately, when it comes to the corporate um, playing field, it's not always equal, right? Some, some people have access to um, familial connections. Some people have it through um, joining fraternities. And so for these Asian Americans in the immigrant communities, and especially, as I mentioned, there are 20 different groups of them. So there's definitely on, you know, unequal access amongst all of them, right? Some of them might be better, but some of them are not, right? So again, in painting a broad stroke, like, you know, that, well, look, educational attainment wise, they're all getting to where they wanna be. Well, that's not necessarily the case. Some of the newer immigrant groups may not have the educational opportunities and definitely across the board, most of these immigrant groups do not have equal access to healthcare equity or pay equity and even educational equity. So in looking at this, definitely the bamboo ceiling keeps cropping up, right? That, that is the symptom of this unequal access. And then the other outcome is that there isn't enough representation at the highest level in terms of C-suite and boardroom. And so we know the symptoms, we know the unequal access, we know about the unfair attention, and the unfair assumptions. So what is there to do? Well, let me talk about that next. Well, for those of you that are in organizations that are progressive, and those of you that are hiring managers who care very deeply about representation and diversity, uh, let me suggest a few things. So first, starting with how we look at what a leader should look like, the latest Harvard Business Review research talked about women, women of colors, different type of leadership skills, but just as relevant. So let me talk about those three. So obviously a lot of times leadership, um, we, we assume <laughs> confidence equals competence, but that is what this article is, is um, rejecting because obviously some people come across as very confident Confident, but they're not necessarily good at their job. So the three leadership capital that's perhaps worth considering for these women of color or Asian American women in particular are navigational capital, resistance capital, and linguistic capital. So what do I mean by navigational capital? Well, that is when you're able to bootstrap. Um, I mentioned that in the immigrant communities, most of these families come from war-torn area or they come from poverty-stricken areas. And yet when they come to the US, they're able to really climb the ladder of success, right? So that navigational capital, being able to bootstrap, being able to be very resourceful is definitely a worthy leadership capital to consider. The second is resistance capital. And what do I mean by that? Well, again, many of these um, new immigrants come from countries with authoritarian regimes or very restrictive class structure. And yet again, when they're able to come to the US, they're relying on some of those resistance and advocacy skills. And I definitely have seen this in my own family and in um, distant relatives' families where the children are actually the one advocating for the parents because of the children's language skills. So being able to, at a young age, represent the family, represent the community is another form of resistance or slash advocacy capital that's very relevant for a leader. And then lastly, as I said earlier about the consumer demands rising 
and uh, India and China are geared up to be the largest consumer segments in the world. So having that linguistic and cultural capital is very important in being able to shed a light on what these consumers could want and how to better situate the companies to take on this market. So those three capital is worth considering, right? In, in checking our biases as far as what a leader should look like. The second thing is to give opportunities and to sponsor and support these ERG employee resource groups. And I know at this conference, there are many speakers talking about that. So I'm sure um, you could get more information about how to start one or how to support one. But I wanna encourage you to also think about how in these immigrant communities, Asian American women can definitely take a leadership role with some of these ERGs. And in taking leadership, they're more likely to be noticed by the top management and to also, again, see how they can demonstrate the three leadership capitals I just talked about. So navigational capital, resistance capital, and linguistic capital. So allowing them to be active in the ERGs will help with demonstrating their leadership, but also in that earlier chart about Bain and Company, that the belonging and inclusion is also very important. And so by having an active ERG, having the sponsorship, having the support from the highest level in the company, that will all help with the inclusion and the belonging efforts at the company level. And third, I wanna talk about how communities can be important too. So as I said, whether, you know, across the different ethnic diaspora that all these different communities have different needs. And again, if you can sponsor and support your Asian American employees to be active in these communities, they'll give them a chance to shine in their own community and help their own community. But also again, it's leadership training, right? When you give them the chance to really do something for their community, align their purpose with the company's mission and help their own community. That's really gonna be helpful in terms of training them to be future leaders. So that's the three things I would encourage companies to look at. One, checking those biases as to what a leader should look like. And two, sponsor and support those employee resource groups as much as you can. And three, do the community outreach and encourage your Asian American women employees to go out into their communities and do something extraordinary such that they can come back and bring some of the leadership skills they learn and deliver that in their own company. So lastly, I want to end on a few resources I can share with you if you want more information. So number one, I have written about this topic. So that's in my Forbes Coaches Council article. Uh, the link is here, but I'm sure if you search on my name and Forbes, you should be able to find it. And then secondly, I'd be happy to link to any of you that would like to have more information and know more about what I do in terms of board diversity. So that's under LinkedIn under Kelly C. Huang. And then lastly, um, if you'd like to know more about how I coach these high potential women, um, feel free to check out Ke Coach Kelly Huang slash 888, which is a lucky number in Chinese. So um, many good fortunes to you. Um, you know, I want to end on a good note. So remember to think about those three biases, right? To, to check yourself when it comes to unfair assumptions, um, unwanted attention and then to think about the unequal access. And then going forward for the companies to really actively encourage them to really look at the leadership biases, what they think a leader should look like, and to consider those three capitals, the navigational capital, the resistance capital, and the linguistic and cultural capital. And then secondly, definitely help and sponsor those ERGs. And lastly, help these Asian American women be active in their community. Thank you very much. And I appreciate you spending the time with me and look forward to connecting with you at some point. Bye now.